want to welcome everybody to Gettysburg National Military Park. My name is Angie Atkinson, and uh, welcome to the anniversary, the 147th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. Now, I will tell you right off, it's the first time I've ever done this. Been on TV, getting filmed, but hopefully we're going to have a good time, okay? And as we go through the program, hopefully we will... And all of you will continue to have a good time. A little story behind the program. Um, some of you have been asking me questions, so I'll let everybody in on the secret. The, the program that we are meeting up with today is conducted by Matt Atkinson. We will be meeting Willard's Brigade because on July 2nd, 1863, General William Barksdale, who we are following, and General George, uh, Cross, excuse me, Colonel Willard, are going to be engaged um, at the end of July 2nd, and, um, you know, Willard will push through. But Matt is my husband, okay? I don't know if anybody noticed the names on the sheets. We're not brother, sister. Um, we are husband and wife. Ironically, we met here at Gettysburg about 10 or so years ago. He became a permanent employee at Gettysburg. I was a seasonal ranger. I worked here just in the summers as, co as a college student. And we, you know, as the book title goes, they met at Gettysburg. We, uh, you know, <laughs> we, <laughs> they, <laughs> you know, fell in love, uh, got engaged. I was working at Independence Hall in Philadelphia because I wanted to further my Park Service career. I found out this is what I wanted to do. And then, you know, he popped the question. Well, he got a promotion to go to Vicksburg, Mississippi. And we have spent, we had spent the, probably the last six and a half years at Vicksburg. I went down there with no job. I had resigned from the Park Service. I didn't know what I was going to do. I hoped to get back in. Um, but I was just going to see what happened. And I was very lucky to work in a small town called Natchez, Mississippi, for the Natchez National Historical Park, and loved it. Did antebellum stuff before the war, the precursor to, you know, what we're doing today. So we got back up to Gettysburg. We were extremely lucky. Careers in the Park Service like this with two people in the same division are extremely rare. And Gettysburg was gracious enough to hire us and believed in what we could do. And so today, hopefully, we will demonstrate that. He will be leading Willard. We will meet up at the end of the program. And then with everyone that we have, um, I'm thinking he's got about the same number, maybe a little less. But um, <laughs> we will meet up and we will conclude the program uh, together with these two groups. So me being from Pennsylvania... I am taking the Mississippi troops forward today. Matt being from Mississippi, he is bringing the New Yorkers forward today. All right. Program length, <laughs> hopefully it'll be about two, two and a half hours. I want to go through a couple things, though, because I want you guys to have a good time. But I also want you to be safe. Luckily, we have beautiful weather. Please, though, be aware that you can still get overheated. You can still become tired. And I don't want anybody to feel that they've got to go from start to finish. I have um, some folks here, Caitlin and Jenna, who are park interns. They are here to help. If you need assistance, we have park radios. And I'm sure we've got about, what, 150 cell phones at this point. All right. So if there is something that happens, please let one of us know. Caitlin and Jenna are in the green shirts, all right, with the backpacks. Um, or let your neighbor know if you can't get to Caitlin and Jenna. We're going to be walking through some grass. We're going to be walking in areas where there may be ticks. FYI, they're out. They're, they're bad, and just, you know, when you go home, make sure you deal with that kind of stuff. I hope you guys have brought some water. That's pretty important. Um, you know, make sure you're drinking lots of fluids. And with that, are there any questions, anything that anybody needs to know before we jump on in to the good stuff? Okay. So as I said, I wanted to welcome everybody to Gettysburg National Military Park. We are, I am honored to be able to do this program on July 2nd, 2010, discussing the events of July 2nd, 1863. But in order to really get a good picture on why Barksdale is going to do what he does, I want to do a little bit of an overview so that we can understand why things are set up the way they are. Now, we are standing today on Seminary Ridge. General Robert E. Lee, commander of the Confederate Army, the Army of Northern Virginia, has advanced into Pennsylvania for a number of reasons, one of which is to hopefully end the Civil War. They, he is specifically hoping that he can come up here, strike a decisive blow against the Union Army, 
gather supplies as his war-torn Virginia has been dealing with this for about two years. We're beginning in 1861, campaign of Gettysburg in 1863. The folks down in Virginia are getting a little tired emotionally, economically, psychologically. Lee needs to get the war out, give the North a bloody nose somewhere up in Pennsylvania in the North and see if he can end this thing. There's a peace movement brewing in the North. There are folks that are getting a little tired of hearing the casualty list, seeing them posted. Um, if they don't know someone who has suffered as a result of this war, they know someone who has suffered as a result of this war. And the Union Army is not doing so hot. They are not w winning a number of the battles. They are losing some major things, and they are also going through um, commanders. Army commanders like there's no tomorrow. Just to give you a good idea, if you go back into your timeline, the commander at the Battle of Antietam in September of 1862 is not the commander at Fredericksburg in December of 62, who is not the commander at Chancellorsville in 63, who is not the commander here at Gettysburg. Now, all of you have jobs, I'm hoping, right? Have had some type of employment. If you have that change in your leadership, you can't form any sort of continuity. Everybody's got a different game plan. We're going to try this. We're going to try that. And unfortunately, the Union Army had very low morale. And so that's something else that Lee is going to be facing as he arrives up here in Pennsylvania. Can he strike that decisive blow? If he can't crush the Army right away, can he at least try and force his way toward Washington, D.C.? A very loose analogy that I like to use with my school groups is it's like capture the flag. Now, obviously, we know it's a little more difficult than that. But for them, the idea is that you gain that capital, you may gain victory. And that is where Lee is heading. So he will arrive in Gettysburg by the end of June. And are actually arriving in the town of Gettysburg by June 26, 1863, with Jubal Early's men heading right through town, going east toward York. The battle will open on July 1st to the west of town from where we are located due west. He will uh, engage the Union Army, though he had not intended to do so. He wanted to arrive in Pennsylvania and take a really a, a defensive approach to his fighting here. And he will not do, be able to do that because he will be thrust into the battle on the, on the morning hours of July 1st, 1863. But as the day unfolds, as the Union Army is arriving up some of the roads to our east here, they engage in the struggle in the morning hours and the late afternoon hours, and by the evening of the 1st, Lee is victorious. He will push the Union Army back towards Cemetery Hill. If we can look to our east, you can notice there is a, a ridge line and traffic on a road there. That, the road directly in front of us is the Emmitsburg Road running roughly north and south. The tree line behind that is Cemetery Ridge. If you follow that tree line to the north, almost as far as you can go, you may see a white circular building poking out of some trees. And that is the old Cyclorama building. Roughly in that area, directly behind it, is Cemetery Hill, and that is where the Union Army will be repulsed to by the evening of July 1st. Now, Lee coming up here, knowing he wanted to fight defensively, is now thrust into this. But he won the day. He took the day. There were great casualties, but he still moved the Union Army off their original positions and back to this hill. Could he maintain that momentum? Could he continue that? And that is where... And that is why we end up in July 2nd, 1863. Can he continue this push against the Union Army, strike this decisive blow, get this thing done and over with? But July 2nd, by the morning of July 2nd, the Confederate Army was not in the area where we are standing. Lee had to determine the Union position. Where in the world is the Union Army? How have they arranged themselves on Cemetery Ridge? What he will do is he will send out a reconnaissance party led by Captain Samuel Johnston. And Johnston, with a couple of other individuals, are going to uh, head out on horseback about 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning, and they are instructed to ride into the southern portion of the field and attempt to locate the Union position. Specifically, they should end up on Little Round Top. We can't see it directly from here, but we'll be able to point that out a little bit later in the program. Get on top of Little Round Top. Let us know where the Union Army is in force. Find out where they are concentrated. Are there masses of, of men ready to go? Well, Johnson will ride around the southern portion of the field. He will attempt to locate these individuals, these Union troops, and he will return back to Lee roughly at 9 o'clock in the morning 
and report to him that he has not found the Union Army in any sort of heavy concentration down in this southern portion of the battlefield. Now, historians today are a little unsure as to where Captain Johnson actually ended up, because he should have seen a number of things. He should have run into some cavalry that had been posted to, on the southern part of the field, Buford's cavalry that had um, now taken position down in this area after they had done their duty on July 1st. He should have run into some possible stragglers from Dan Sickles' 3rd Corps that would have been coming up the Emmitsburg Road. He should have run into the Signal Corps folks that were up on Little Round Top sending messages to George Meade in the Leicester House, which was his headquarters. But more importantly, let's say by chance he didn't run into anybody there. He should have heard them. You're talking about thousands of Union troops. You've got canteens, you've got haversacks, you've got backpacks, you've just got noise. We, and somebody needs to count for me before the end of the program, we have a good number of people. We're going to be loud, all right, walking through these fields. You have thousands, tens of thousands of men. They're going to be loud, too, not to mention all the livestock, the horses, etc. How he didn't hear the presence of the Union Army, even if he didn't see it, how he didn't hear it, is... Um, Almost unbelievable. But unfortunately, he will take that information back to Lee, and Lee will set up his game plan. And this is how Barksdale will now be involved in July 2nd, 1863. To set up for a second, the Union line is on Cemetery Ridge, due east. Roughly from where we are, we can see the Sherfy Farm, which is the red structure and barn, uh, directly to our east. I'm looking behind some folks. We'll use that roughly as our point of reference. The Union line is not going to continue that far south. In fact, it will end at the Pennsylvania Monument. Keep that in mind as we advance forward and are able to see that. It is one of the largest monuments on the field. It has a dome with an angel on the top of it. But the Union line does not extend to the southern portion of the field either. General George Meade realizes that this uh, is an important in fact, he realizes he needs to hold some of the high ground to the south of his line. He can't leave his flank open for possible Confederate attack. So what he is going to do is he is going to give uh, orders to General Dan Sickles, commander of the Union Third Corps, roughly 10,000 men, to hold that position. And I like to tell folks he's to attach from the monument and place his left on Little Round Top. As we are looking at that, it would be the right of the Union line. Dan Sickles is not a West Point trained individual. He is actually a politician that has kind of moved his way up into the ranks, but now commander of the Union Third Corps. He is not a fan of this spot. In fact, that position would be in a valley, in a descending portion of the field, than to ascend to Little Round Top. He wasn't sure that's where he wanted his men to be. He was afraid that he would get stuck in this valley and not be able to handle a possible Confederate attack on his front. He sees better ground, in his opinion. He sees better ground three quarters of a mile in front of him in the Peach Orchard. Now the Peach Orchard, if we follow the Wheatfield Road, to our south here, to its intersection with the Emmitsburg Road, the Peach Orchard, as we refer to it today, is right at that intersection. Back then it was just a Peach Orchard, owned by and operated by Joseph Sherfee. Dan Sickles sees that Peach Orchard and he is concerned about his line. He wants to move his men out there and he will do so. I mean, he's going to have a discussion with General Meade. He's going to send him a couple memos by courier. Hey, you know, I think this would be a really good idea. You should come and, and check this spot out. But Meade is much too busy. All right, he can't do that. So Dan Sickles is going to, you know, try and get other people. He's going to go to General Henry Hunt, Chief of Union Artillery. Hey, isn't this a great spot for our guns? You know, it's an artillery platform, an open field of fire. We should really be utilizing this rather than being in that valley there. And Henry Hunt, a very intelligent individual, agrees. He's like, yeah, that's a perfect artillery platform. However, I can't give you the go-ahead to move your men out there. That's got to come from General Meade. Long story short, by roughly 2 o'clock in the afternoon, Dan Sickles is fed up. He wants to move his men out here, and he will disobey his commanding officer. He will move his men from Cemetery Ridge out into the Peach Orchard. Now, I said roughly 2 o'clock in the afternoon when things get going. What has been happening on the Confederate line is they are preparing for battle. They are preparing for battle, though, with that piece of information that arrived to them at 9 o'clock in the morning. Lee had wanted to send down two divisions, that of General Lafayette McClaws and John Hood, 
to the southern portion of the field. He wanted to attack the Union Army on what they understood as their open flank by the Pennsylvania Monument on Cemetery Ridge. They wanted to send their men perpendicular to the road and have them advance up this direction, crushing the Union flank. All right, imagine a straight line. Imagine the Union Army as we're looking at them. The Union Army being a straight line, the Confederates would be perpendicular to that. This is all I remember from geometry class. All right, so I wasn't really good in math. So you've got this perpendicular nature. That is a great spot for the Confederates, ideally, or theoretically to be in because they are attacking the end of the Union line. Remember, Union's facing us at this point. The only way that the Union Army can blunt that attack is to physically change front. And that would take time to do so. So that's what Lee wants to do. He wants to roll them up possibly to Cemetery Hill. He is going to try and get this thing started early in the morning, but it will not work out that way. There's organizational issues, and not to mention General James Longstreet is not a fan of this idea. Eventually the men will get started there. They are meeting over on Hers Ridge to our west. These two divisions will start marching down toward this area. They want to maintain some secrecy, a screen behind the wood lots on Seminary Ridge. They don't want to be seen by this Union Signal Corps on Little Round Top. Because if the Signal Corps sees them, they can wave their flags and send their messages to General George Meade and let him know, hey, guess what? There's some folks coming. So they're trying to maintain the secret secrecy, but unfortunately, as McClaws' men crest one of the ridges, they can actually uh, see and be seen by the Union Signal Corps. They don't want to give up their whole surprise. They've given up a little bit there. They've got to stop, turn around, and try and get themselves rerouted so that they can arrive down here without maybe exposing the entire extent of the troops coming down towards Seminary Ridge. To go about a mile, they're going to end up walking four miles. It will take roughly hours to do this. So any idea of a morning assault is going to be blown out of the water. And unfortunately for the Confederates, no one had really sent anybody out to double check, just to make sure if uh, that Union line was still as it was at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. Now... When the Confederates arrived, finally they, they've dealt with their delays, they're marching, they are attempting to deploy in these woods on the southern portion of Seminary Ridge. General Lafayette McClaws is going to step out, and some advanced uh, troops are going to step out, and they are going to find 10,000 men now in their front. Not at all what they were expecting. They were coming down here expecting an open plane to attack through, is no longer a possibility. And so that plan of placing those men perpendicular to the Union line is not going to work. And in fact, one of my favorite historians, uh, Harry Fonz, wrote, he says, quote, If McClaws had sworn mighty oaths when forced to countermarch a few hours earlier that day, he must have strained his vocabulary after studying the federal position along the Emmitsburg Road. You can only imagine the what he was voicing as he came out through those trees and saw now 10,000 men in his front. How is this going to change the battle plan? Well, rather than attacking in that perpendicular fashion, they will now have to begin the attack with uh, General Hood's men, which are going to, if you follow this tree line all the way south toward the Emmitsburg Road, as far as you can see, that's where Hood's men will go, are going to attack from, and they must now attack in echelon. They will start attacking by brigade on the brigade level. Brigade, roughly 1,400, 1,600 individuals, depending on which one you're with. And it's much like dominoes or waves crashing on a shore. The first brigade moves in. After a little bit of a delay, the next brigade moves in. And this would then continue up the Confederate line. That is how these men will now have to attack, and that is how General Barksdale will participate with his Mississippians on July 2nd, 1863. Hood's men will launch the attack roughly around 4 o'clock in the afternoon, somewhere between 4 and 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and they will swoop down into the valley there and commence their attack on the areas known as Devil's Den and Little Round Top. Barksdale is chomping at the bit to get in. I learned one thing while living in the South. There's some folks I can get fired up. 
He was ready to go. Numerous individuals talked about him. Uh, Fonz mentions that he was not a graceful horseman, though his forward, impetuous bearing, especially in battle, overshadowed and more than made up for such deficiencies. He's ready to go. He is absolutely ready to send his men in and get this thing over with. But he can't. He's got to wait. There's delays. McClaws won't let him go in. Longstreet won't let him go in. He's waiting, pacing back and forth. In the meantime, some skirmishers are going to be sent out from Company C of the 17th Mississippi. They're going to be sent out to deal with some fences that were in front. It was really a game of uh, cat and mouse because the Union artillery, some of which lined on the Emmitsburg Road, had a direct fire into those men. So nobody initially volunteered for that job when volunteers were asked for to go tear down the fences. And finally, some folks were drafted for that job. If you didn't volunteer, somebody was going to get picked. So the guys from Company C run out, tear down the fences, and run on back behind the stone wall. Now, Barksdale's Mississippians are probably on the back slope of Seminary Ridge, not necessarily out here in the front where we are standing. In fact, this would have been lined with Confederate artillery, roughly 41 guns concentrating on, this, on, the, on the Union left flank. Again, all having converging fire, fo focusing on the same place. Barksdale would give orders. He said, the line before you must be broken. To do so, let every officer and man animate his comrades by his personal presence in the front line. Still being antsy. After trying to get permission from General McClaws, he would then have an opportunity to ask permission from General James Longstreet. And Barksdale would say, quote, I wish you would let me go in, General. I would take that battery in five minutes. And Longstreet countered. He said, wait a little. We are all going in presently. His men would be called to attention. They would line up. They would have to pass over the stone walls. Some would be delayed by extricating themselves from some of the Confederate batteries that were in their front. And as Colonel Humphrey says of the 21st Mississippi, uh, exuding an energy never seen before, he said, quote, 1,400 rifles were grasped with firm hands. And as the line officers repeated the command, forward march, the men sprang forward and 1,400 voices raised the famous yell. And so for us, we are now all going in presently. So with that, I want everyone to gather your belongings and we are going to continue now to our next stop. We're now standing in what has become known as the Peach Orchard. Now, Joseph Sherfy would be living in the structure, the pink, maroon, mauve structure that's going to be to our west. You can see a barn right now. You can see a cluster of trees. Um, we saw the house from our perspective at the Mississippi Monument. Sherfy's going to own um, some acreage here, and he's going to be one of the first individuals to actually use the peaches in a commercial enterprise. Most of these farmers were subsistence farmers. They, they worked off the land. They lived off the land. They worked to live, basically. If they didn't get out and plow the fields, they didn't eat. Sherfy here, though, is going to be able to take his peaches and sell them in town into um, other local establishments. Now, this area would become the peach orchard proper. Let's talk a little bit about Dan Sickles. We'll revisit that and his, the line that he is going to put out here. We can get a much better perspective now of Cemetery Ridge. We can now also see the Pennsylvania Monument. Remember we said Union Army ended there. Dan Sickles was to con connect the Pennsylvania Monument to Little Round Top. If you, looked be if you look behind you or to your right, you can see Big Round Top, the larger hill on the right. And just at an almost 45 degree angle, you can see Little Round Top. There's a clearing on the face of that and a large castle-looking monument there. So that is the line that Sickles is supposed to hold. He will decide this is a higher platform, this is a better artillery spot, and he will want to move his men out here, and he will do so. He will create something called a salient. For my school kids, a bump on a log. All right. The salient is basically going to run from the peach orchard to sort of being the keystone, and it will take a line extending along the Emmitsburg Road as you pass the Sherfy Farm, 
uh, the Klingle Farm, which is the next red barn, and a little bit past that. That is going to be um, held by roughly Graham's Brigade. The rest of the line is going to be sort of in pieces, but it will continue on a roughly diagonal line through this peach orchard and then down across the stony hill to the base of Little Round Top. It will never actually hold the heights of Little Round Top. It will be at the base of Round Top in the area known as Devil's Den. One thing that um, was unfortunate for the Union line is that these 10,000 men were not sufficient enough to hold this position. It was a very thin line. They weren't able to throw up breastworks or earthworks. If you'll notice around you, as the Park Service has been attempting to rehabilitate the landscape, we are putting fences back where they should have been, and you don't see any major stone walls out here that they could have used for defensive protection. All they could have done was maybe taken down some fences that hadn't been already taken or utilized in the days before. Ooh. Turn that down a little bit. All right. Barksdale is roughly going to step off around 545, 6 o'clock in the evening. He will be advancing from the tree line from which we came. A huge 41 artillery barrage is going to take place prior to that. As they advance, they're going to be tearing down some fences that were a little too close to the Union position. And the first people that they will run into is actually the 63rd Pennsylvania, skirmish detail that had been sent in advance of, uh, of Graham's brigade, the line on the right side here. They are going to be the first to engage Barksdale's Mississippians. Unfortunately, they are going to exhaust their ammunition and head back to the rear. They are looking at an unimproved line held by Graham's men, and in fact, there's going to be some artillery batteries that will eventually line this road and also, in part, operate out of where the Sherfy House is located. In fact, one of the Union artillerymen, Private Ernest Simpson, um, had placed himself in harm's way over at the Sherfy Farm. He was actually a clerk, an artillery clerk. And the guys there told him, like, look, you don't need to be out here on the line. Okay, you don't need to be out here in this mess, firing back and forth. Well, it turns out that the intended bride that he had was not approved by his parents. And so if he had died, he didn't want to return back to his family and deal with that situation. So if he died, it was okay. And the Confederates would actually take care of that for him. So unfortunately, he would, he would lose his life as the result of a show. Barksdale's brigade is going to unleash the rebel yell, but they're not actually going to fire a volley until they get about 40 yards close to that position. As they're advancing, um, a number of accounts talk about the Mississippians advancing like demons, yelling loud um, with this energy behind them. And I think Barksdale was definitely a part of that. He was a lawyer, a newspaper edit editor, um, a fire eater, states' rights advocate, um, a really... What do I want to say? Maybe eclectic personality. As these Mississippians press, press, they are heading for the area where we are standing. Now, the area that's going to be attacked initially at our location uh, will be pressed by the 21st Mississippi. They will actually guide along the Wheatfield Road and head directly for this position. The 13th, 17th, and 18th Mississippi will be pressing in the fields that it were paralleling the Wheatfield Road that we were walking directly next to. So we followed the advance up to this point in the Union line of roughly the 21st Mississippi. Now today we're going to try and follow all the brigades to give you a rough idea because it is roughly at this point that things will start to change for the Mississippians. They will not remain as one, but they will actually start to split. Now, before we do that, before we actually split, I want to head us over to the Sherfy Farm. I know this was a short stop, but I wanted you to be able to see the perspective of the Union line, see the perspective of the Confederate line. I want to head over to the Sherfy Farm to talk about some of the fighting and engagements that took place there. So if we go ahead and gather up our belongings, and we'll walk on the far side of the Wheatfield Road, we'll walk all the way over to the point where we are across from the Sherfy Farm, and then we can cross over to the front. All right, we'll go ahead and then begin. All right, so are we good? 
Excellent. Well, I know that was a quick stop, but I think it was essential in pointing out where Sickles was coming from, the line that he is supposed to hold, and how his men were placed on the Emmitsburg Road heading down toward Devil's Den, and now we've come across the Emmitsburg Road to the Shurfee Farm to gain a perspective of what the Mississippians are doing. You can see your vehicles to the west here along Seminary Ridge, and as Mississippi would come out through those trees, it is from here, about 40 yards in front of us, roughly, uh, well, maybe a little closer than where that far fence line, that distant fence line is, is where they will engage the 63rd Pennsylvania that has been sent out on skirmish detail in front of Graham's line. Now, Graham's brigade is going to be comprised of the 105th, 57th, 114th, and 68th Pennsylvania. They will all be lining the Emmitsburg Road here, and the 141st will actually be facing south. That is where we were, that's where our last stop was. That's where we were facing south. They will be looking basically at um, General Kershaw's men pressing the attack on the southern portion of the Peach Orchard. Now, they began taking heavy shelling from the Confederates roughly three o'clock in three o'clock in the afternoon. And one soldier wrote, he said, "None of the various duties which a soldier is called upon to perform, and none of the various vicissitudes and dangers that he is expected to face, call for such bravery and endurance as thus remaining passive under an enemy's artillery fire that has got an accurate range and from which there is no protection." Standing out on that peach orchard, I think you realize there was no protection for those men. Now, they had been moved out in the afternoon of July 1863. Unlike today, it was 80-some degrees in the high 80s, high humidity. These guys are in wool uniforms, and there is nowhere they can go. All right, they can't run back and get any water. What they've got is in their canteen. They are baking out in the sun. Some of them not having eaten for a number of days, or at least eaten well. Okay, so now they're dealing with this artillery barrage, this intense artillery duel that will be taking place. In fact, another soldier wrote that the Confederate artillery on Seminary Ridge and some of the artillery here along the Emmitsburg Road were almost firing at a, a roughly point-blank range, point blank range. It was direct fire. There was no lobbing it up and over your head. They were firing directly in to one another. And in fact, Colonel E.P. Alexander, comparing it to the Battle of Antietam, talked about the artillery duel there as being artillery hell. This became a close second for the volume um, of things that were being thrown back and forth. The 68th Pennsylvania, which is going to be on the far side of the Wheatfield Road, and the 114th, which is where we are roughly standing right here, are going to be comprised of almost 700 men. Um, the one farm we didn't speak of was the Wentz Farm. We actually passed over that on the way here. The Wentz Foundation does still exist, uh, but the building does not. And that building was also a structure that the Mississippians and the Pennsylvanians would be utilizing during this. Now, the 57th Pennsylvania had advanced over the Emmitsburg Road first, followed by the 114th. The 114th represented by the monument here known as Collis Zouaves, on the Zouaves, the very French-influenced um, uniform that they'd be wearing. There was um, Buckland's battery of six guns here and a section of Thompson's battery that was also located here. Pressed somewhere beyond the Sherfrey Farm to find directly at the Mississippians and soon to be their re roughly their reinforcements, General Wofford's brigade. A soldier out of Graham's brigade wrote, he said, the impetus of our advance carried us to the Emmitsburg Road in the face of the murderous musketry fire of the advancing enemy. Reaching the road, we clambered over the fence and crossed it. Sherfy's house and outbuildings intervening between us and the approaching enemy, the right of the regiment was advanced to the rear of the house. So the 114th is essentially going to push through the Sherfy farm. Um, today, unfortunately, we don't have the original Sherfy barn that unfortunately was consumed during the battle. But the soldiers, using the buildings as protection, again, that's really the only thing that afforded them any sort of protection. Uh, their, their right was roughly located in an oat field to the right of the peach orchard, the 105th on the right of them facing this direction, and the 68th is going to be on the opposite side of the wheat field road near the tablets where, where we first started to assemble. They said the enemy opened upon us the concentrated fire of his batteries, and immediately we were in the midst of a terrific shower of shot and shell, and every conceivable kind of missile made terrible havoc among us. Lieutenant Alexander Wallace of the 114th called on his men to fire in between the barn and the Sherfy house as the Confederates continued to press their attack through the fields. 
roughly we would be experiencing the attack of the 13th, 17th, and 18th Mississippi. The 21st will guide on the Wheatfield Road and actually attack and press their assault at the intersection of the Wheatfield Road and the Emmitsburg Road. It's a desperate struggle here at the Sherfy Farm. They talked about hand-to-hand -hand fighting, club muskets, um, men opening up with uh, grape and canister. Now, the barn, one soldier said, was converted basically into a fortress by some of the Union men. But it was smoldering because of all the artillery fire, the exploding shell that was raining down on this area as well. And in fact, I want to get ahead of myself here. In fact, one soldier reported that it was so loud between the artillery fire, the musketry fire, uh, just battle in general, that they couldn't even hear each other at 20 paces. In order to get this guy's attention, you had to run over and shake him to tell him, hey, we're about to be overtaken. we got to get out of here. And as the Confederates would press, that energy would cause the Union troops to have to reorganize and attempt to fall back. On the opposite side of the line, on the, the south side of the Wheatfield Road, some of the batteries had incurred so many casualties that infantrymen are actually trying to help some of the artillerymen by bringing up ammunition and firing some of the guns. As the 21st started to press the 68th Pennsylvania, soon they realized the line was not going to be able to hold. The 68th potentially saw themselves being enfiladed as the 21st continued to move down the Wheatfield Road. And that would also be the case here with the 114th. The 68th being at the corner of those roads. Being from Pennsylvania, I refer to them as the keystone of Sickles Line. Once that corner falls, the problem is, is that the only regiments out there, the 68th Pennsylvania, the 2nd New Hampshire roughly, and the 141st Pennsylvania, when they start to fall back, it leaves this line open for enfilade fire by the 21st. All the 21st theoretically have to do is swing around, change front, and they're firing into the left of these soldiers. Once that portion breaks, that sickle salient is almost no longer viable. And they will have to start coming up with a different game plan on how they are going to deal with the press of the Confederate troops. Some reinforcements had come up behind the 114th. They were of the 73rd New York, but they couldn't do anything when they arrived. They were about 100 yards behind the ridge here because they didn't want to fire into the backs of the men of the 114th. So they had to hold their fire and wait until the 114th removed themselves off the ridge. And then they could be thrown in as reinforcements. It is here that the Mississippians will split. It is here that you will find three brigades, the 13th, 17th, and 18th, will continue to press over the Emmitsburg Road. But then they will eventually kind of pivot. Using the Sherfy Farm as a pivot, they will wheel and almost face directly north and press through the rest of Graham's line and continue on toward their goal, which was to break through Cemetery Ridge. The 21st, however, will not do that. Seeing that they will break through, they will be able to push the 68th Pennsylvania back from their advanced position, they will also notice batteries. They will notice artillery batteries in their front. And it is these batteries, and specifically the battery of the 9th Massachusetts, that they will deal with, attempt to capture, and attempt to push back toward Cemetery Ridge. So what we're going to now do, we are going to follow as best we can, the 21st and their advance down the Wheatfield Road and uh, the 9th Massachusetts retreat. We'll talk about that, and then we'll pick back up at the 13th, 17th, and 18th um, after we do that. All right? Okay, sounds good. Let's head on out. What we'll do is um, let us walk on this side of the Emmitsburg Road, then we'll, then we'll cross over, and what I want to do is I would like to meet down by the... Um, Bigelow Monument, for those of you that are familiar with that. Okay?
There we go. All right. Writing a, a post-war account by this time General Benjamin Humphreys, who was colonel here, colonel of the 21st Mississippi. He said, quote, When we had advanced one or two hundred yards beyond the peach orchard, I discovered some guns at the foot of the slope to my right, firing rapidly on Kershaw's line. I immediately wheeled the 21st Regiment away from the brigade and to the right. What uh, then Colonel Humphreys is talking about is the Wheatfield Line Artillery, the Wheatfield Road Artillery Line, excuse me. This is going to be the only way that the Union Army can reinforce Dan Sickles' very vulnerable position. You put 10,000 infantrymen out there in a very loose a conglomeration, you make a funky V shape, you try and hold Devil's Den to the peach orchard up and past uh, the Klingle farm, you don't have a lot to work with. And that's actually one reason why General Meade preferred him on Cemetery Ridge, not out here. He realized there would be not enough reinforcements to hold this advanced position. Colonel Humphreys is going to capitalize on that. Once he crosses over the road, he will see, as he mentioned, the artillery lining this. We are at the spot where the 9th Massachusetts would be located. Their front covering roughly 85 yards with their six guns. But artillery all up and down the Wheatfield Road, directing their fire toward the oncoming Mississippians and toward the South Carolina troops that would have been approaching from the direct south, commanded by General Kershaw. Now, when Colonel Humphrey crests that ridge, he will realize that these guns can possibly destroy the advancing Mississippians. And so what he will do is, rather than kind of wheeling or pivoting with the rest of, his, uh, with the, rest of the Mississippi regiments, he will actually press down toward these individuals. Now, a little history on, the, on Bigelow's battery. Bigelow... Um, Captain John Bigelow, this is actually going to be the first time that many of these men will be engaged. In fact, Sergeant Baker wrote, he said, As this was the first time most of us had been under fire, the experience was new and untried. But we were all calm, and many realized that perhaps it was the last time that we should all be together. These guys had not been tried in battle. And basically what they are told is they are told they have to hold to the last to the last gun, to the last individual, to the last horse, to the last piece of ammunition. Because as that keystone would begin to fall, as the 68th Pennsylvania, the 2nd New Hampshire, would drop back into the fields that you see to the west, just before the Emmitsburg Road, and try and reform, they realized that they would not be able to hold off impending doom. The Mississippians, the 1600 Mississippians, were just too strong. And the line that Graham's men, Sickles' men, were now holding was just too weak. They would have to cover this retreat. The only way they can cover that is to maintain their flow of fire, their rate of fire. Because they have to allow the infantry to retreat through the fields first because they cannot fire their guns with masses of men in their front. They've got to make sure they are behind them. It's almost a leapfrog situation. The infantry needs to go back, then the artillery can fall back. As the infantry fire, falls back more, the, the artillery can fall back even more. They were bowling solid shot towards Kershaw men. They were bowling shot towards Mississippi's men. But they noticed... Quote, on our right, hidden from us by the rising ground and the peach orchard, the Confederate battery soon began to enfilade our line. The Massachusetts and the artillery folks are facing this direction. So when the 21st comes over the road, over the hill there, they are firing directly into the right flank. The problem with artillery is that you can't change front real quick. And other than the actual gun the cannon, you have no other means of defense. So if you were getting enfiladed on your right, you don't have a gun that you can shoot. A rifle, I should say. You don't have a rifle where you can shoot those infantrymen coming. What you're going to have to do is you're going to have to take your piece and you're going to have to wheel it to face those oncoming men. And so you have to make sure that you are not then firing into the battery that is right next to you. Not to mention, as the Mississippians would be enfilading the line, they can start taking out the cannoneers. You know, a good crew, it took about ten men to run one of those guns. And they would run drills where if you lost an individual, you would pick up their parts and their roles. But soon, it would get to the point where you couldn't fire, you know, if you were just left with one man, you can't fire that gun by yourself. Though sometimes many would try. Captain Phillips continued, he said, what bothered, 
what bothered us the most was a battery on our right which we could not see, which was throwing case shot at us very carelessly. And every minute a shower of bullets would come in with a whoosh, just like a heavy shower of hailstones. You've got different type of ammunition when you're firing one of these uh, cannons. You have your solid cannonball, which, is, which tends to be used for fortifications. Or if you've got the opportunity to fire it down the length of a line, you have your exploding shell, your, uh, which is actually going to be an exploding cannonball designed, and I'll use you guys as an example, designed to explode up here. That way the shrapnel rains down on the approaching men. And then you have things like grape shot and canister, where the, the cannon, the gun, can actually function much like a shotgun. In the sense that your, your canister is a 27 one inch iron balls and a tin can, once that powder bag is ignited, the tin can in a sense will disintegrate and from the muzzle all those canister balls will come raining out. And a, a lot of the soldiers, if you read their letters, will use that reference of hail. They will talk about the hail coming toward them. And it can be the canister balls, it can be the grape shot, and it can be the mini balls that were being fired. But if you've ever, I guess the closest thing I can think of is when you have those mosquitoes buzzing by your ear, you hear that faint buzz. Imagine amplifying that, you know, a couple hundred times and having that be, you know, hot lead coming right at you. Charles Reed said, glancing towards the peach orchard on my right, I saw the Confederates had come through and were forming a line 200 yards distant, extending back parallel with the Emmitsburg Road as far as I could see. The 9th Massachusetts being told to hold to the last is going to have to make a decision. How in the world can they cover the retreat of these Union men and deal with the 21st Mississippi? Well, what they will implement is something called retire by prolong. Now, the, an artillery piece has a natural, natural recoil, and in fact, I worked on an artillery crew down in Vicksburg, Mississippi. We were firing uh, out an embrasure, which is, you have fortifications and a nice square hole that the cannon would project through, and that recoil would actually move that thing about two to three feet back. Bigelow's men are going to capitalize on that and utilize that to help them fall back, cover their tree, but maintain fire. You don't want those guns to be silent. When those guns are silent, they're not doing any damage to your enemy, whether it be Kershaw's men pressing here or the 21st Mississippi pressing up and over the ridge. There will be a hot struggle. Bigelow's men will again have to hold to the last. Will they be able to prevent the Confederates from breaking through? It is up to them, their first time in battle, to attempt to do this. They will attempt something called retire by prolong. There's a large rope that's attached to the trail of the gun. It's called a prolong. And you would attach that to the base of the cannon. And the idea is that as the natural recoil takes place, the men or horses can pull that rope and continue that momentum. It's not quick. It's a very slow process. But what it does allow you to do is continue to fire and load the piece. And that keeps up that constant and pressing um, fire on the enemy. So what we are going to now do is we are going to start following roughly Bigelow's retreat and talk about the press of the Mississippians to where they will engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat by the Trostle Farm. Okay, I was uh, just you know listening to the conversation as we were coming down the path, and it's you know with a group this size, it's really hard to kind of talk to everybody and gauge what they're doing and how they're feeling during the course of the program. But um, the one thing I did heard was I heard somebody, and I'll paraphrase, like you know, man, can you imagine trying to pull a cannon back on this kind of ground? I mean, I was watching people's ankles were rolling, you know, where everybody's kind of off unbalanced, but one of the reasons we do these programs is for that experience, what that individual just said. Can you imagine what these guys were going through trying to pull this artillery battery or these six guns back? Can you, can you imagine under fire you're being pressed from two sides. You're being pressed from Kershaw's men to the south, Barksdale's Mississippians, which would have come just over that rise there where you see the fence line. The stress of knowing that you can't go anywhere. 
You can't do a single thing until you receive an order to pull back. You're to hold to the last. And so hopefully, by walking across these fields, you will walk away with, if nothing more than the experience. You were on the fields, on some of the roads and farm lanes that these men fought and died on. So let's look at what the 21st Mississippi and the 9th Massachusetts will do here. The 9th Massachusetts will actually have, they, they will be retreating, firing by prolong, but being on the Wheatfield Road, being in that, that linear fashion, will not allow them to fight on all fronts. Okay? They would only then be able to defend against Kershaw's guys coming from the south. What they will have to do is arrange themselves in a semicircular and an arch pattern. Okay? to defend against the problem we talked about being enfiladed by the 21st Mississippi. They didn't want to leave that flank open, so what they're going to have to do is, is kind of fan out in a semicircular position to fire at the Confederates, the South Carolinians and Kershaw's Brigade, and Mississippians coming right over the crest of the ridge there. In this semicircular pattern, though, the problem with retiring by prolong is as these men inch their way back, and it's not, not a fast retreat, keep in mind, because they are firing every chance they get, and the, the horses or the men can only pull this two-ton gun in a limited amount of time. As they are moving back, slowly but surely, that semicircle starts to close in on itself. And it gets to that point roughly here by the Trossel Farm. All right, the, the 9th Massachusetts, feeling the pressure of the 21st Mississippi, trying to fight on two different fronts, has, t has taken that semicircle and has almost collapsed in upon itself. Still being told to hold to the last, though, they are firing everything they've got. They are down horses, they are down men, and they are slowly working through the rest of their ammunition. Now the 21st sees something that the, I don't know if the 9th was quite sure of. At least, you know, at this point in the battle. The 9th realized that there wasn't a whole lot of reinforcements back on Cemetery Ridge, but the 21st, they're heading this way. They can see that there's nobody back there. Initially. They see an opportunity. Because remember, the whole point of this attack from the South by the Confederates is to capture that Union left. If they can break through and keep pushing that assault, maybe they can accomplish General Lee's objective to go back to the very beginning of the program and end the entire Civil War. But as they continue to push, the Mississippians press to roughly about 50 yards to the right of uh, the 9th Massachusetts. Barksdale's men are advancing and they're getting basically double shots from the guns. And they're loading, you know, two and three sets of canister, whatever they've got left. But soon, from the ridge above, the Mississippians will open, quote, a fearful musketry fire and men and horses were falling like hail. Now, Colonel Griffith of the 18th... Pardon me, we don't want to do that one yet. As they descend down over the ridge, as they are approaching the 9th Massachusetts, it will soon disintegrate into hand-to-hand -to -hand combat. These guys are going to be trying to save the guns, because what is the problem with the Confederates gaining the artillery? That's right. They could turn them around. All they had to do was flip the guns around and start firing on any approaching infantry. It really wasn't that difficult. The only way the Union Army can disable those guns is to spike them or to damage them in a way that they cannot be fired. And so some of these men are going to be, you know, rushing up to the gun. Some of them, are, um, one of the quotes was that they were straddling the tubes, um, you know, sitting on land, hand-to-hand -hand fighting, clubbing muskets, duking it out. The Confederates would end up capturing four out of Bigelow's six guns initially. But Colonel Griffith of the 18th, I'm sorry, one of the soldiers from the 21st Mississippi wrote, he said, I now saw we had advanced too far to the front for safety, though no gun was firing at us. I could see that Barksdale, several hundred yards to my left, was checked, as well as Kershaw on my right, in front of Little Round Top. Now soon Barksdale fell mortally wounded, and I saw Kershaw give way and was t retiring toward the peach orchard, with a heavy reinforcing line advanced. I saw my safety was in a hurried retreat. 
Now, he's got his uh, things a little bit out of order there, but the point is, is that the 21st Mississippi, as they will continue to push, Barksdale's men, I'm sorry, Bigelow's men, some of them will actually have to take their gun, run up and over the stone wall and trying to escape, but the 21st are going to continue to press. They're going to see that gap in the Union line and try to exploit that. Now, there's going to be a guy back on Cemetery Ridge, Colonel Freeman, Freeman McGilvery, who's going to try and set up an artillery position along Cemetery Ridge and some advanced guns, and actually, um, and eventually we'll get to this, uh, some troops from Willard's Brigade are going to come out. And as the Mississippians continue to advance, they start to realize something, that they are the only ones out there. They don't have anybody coming behind them necessarily. They don't have anybody to support them. They are their own entity pressing out into the fields just to our east. Because the rest of their regiment has stayed up against the Emmitsburg Road. They have continued to crush the left of Graham's Brigade, and they are pressing on a more northeasterly direction toward the rest of the Union line on Cemetery Ridge. So what we are going to do now is we are going to walk back up United States Avenue and continue and try and press the Mississippi attack across the fields toward our final meeting stop. Okay? All right. Well, since walking up United States Avenue, uh, briefly discussing the action with the 9th Massachusetts and the 21st Mississippi, what we are now, we are completing now Barksdale's Brigade. So we are now going to press as if we were the 13th, 17th, and 18th. They are going to be the folks, and the action happens simultaneously. So, you know, trying to cover the whole thing, we kind of have to do it in segments and backtrack it and look at different things. But keep in mind that these, these guys are splitting at the same time, and the action is occurring at the same time. As the 21st is pressing through the fields just behind us, in which we walk through part of that, they are engaging Bigelow's men down here. The... 13th, 17th, and 18th are dealing now with destroying the rest of Graham's brigade. And so, in fact, what is going to happen is that the 13th, 17th, they're going to move basically over the Emmitsburg Road, pressing through the Sherfee Farm, guiding on the 18th Mississippi. The 18th is going to be the furthest to our right or the Mississippians' left. And they will pivot. They will literally pivot from the Sherfee Farm, and now they're all facing north. So we can kind of use United States Avenue as um, a reference point. The brigade, roughly speaking, could, could have been lined along this road and facing north in this fashion. But what they are going to do is press against the 114th, Pennsylvania, the Zouave um, Regiment, who will soon lose their footing, and the 73rd New York that had come up behind them in support can only hold their fire until the 114th drops behind them. Now the 73rd can open up. They will envelop the Sherfy Barn, or the Mississippians will, and they open the door to find smoldering smoke, and they will capture a number of Union individuals as prisoners of war. The next in line for the Mississippians, again like raging demons, they will then blow through the rest of Graham's line, the 105th Pennsylvania and the 57th Pennsylvania. PA troops engaged Barksdale's men, who basically held their fire until they were almost on top of the Pennsylvania troops. And at that point, it was much too overwhelming for these individuals. And there would be attempts, because by this point, General Sickles is now wounded. General Burney has taken over command. Burney was a division commander in the Third Corps. And they will attempt to try and reform that salient. Remember that, that V, that funky V shape we were talking about way over in the peach orchard at the early portion of the program? Burney will attempt to try and redo that sort of where we are standing here. Um, try and basically just pull that salient back in order to still protect Cemetery Ridge and the fact that it is open and then try and keep a semblance of order for his men. 
But unfortunately for the Union Army, uh, they will not be able to maintain that for any significant amount of time. What is coming behind the Confederate infantry is the Confederate artillery. Um, especially Alexander's batteries, Wolf Folk's batteries, are going to be pushing, uh, following the advance of the infantry. And actually when they get to the point of the Emmitsburg Road, they have a clear field of fire into units that are going to be trying to advance into the field behind us to support Graham's brigade, or actually at this point, I guess you could say Graham's retreat. One of the things though, that the Confederate artillerymen noticed when they got to the Emmitsburg Road, uh, they noticed the intensity of the fighting, because as they approached the road, many of them had to stop their pieces, and stopping a bunch of horses, you know, moving a gun forward, you just don't stop on a dime. But they had to stop their pieces because they could not place their guns in the road because it was littered with not many dead bodies. And so some of these individuals individuals were picking up the dead and the wounded, moving them aside so that they could place their guns on that road. As we said, Bernie's now in charge of the, of the 3rd Corps. Uh, the Mississippi troops will soon engage men from the Excelsior Brigade. A number of men from uh, New York are actually going to be placed in the field directly behind us. Thank you for that gentleman for walking through the fields for us to give us some perspective. But they're going to be placed again in roughly that salient position, not able to hold, and eventually um, the Confederate troops are going to start wreaking havoc on the Union men that are trying to come out and support. The 17th and 18th, commanded by Colonel Holder and Colonel Griffith, looks to Bark Barksdale with a desire to halt their, men's as they, their men as they notice their lines were starting to become ragged. Remember, even though the Mississippians are pressing and pressing and advancing, they are not... Uh, without their own casualties. And so they are taking casualties just as well. The advance has gone on for roughly an hour, and they are losing men, losing strength. Walford is no longer behind them in support. He has actually gone down the Wheatfield Road. So it is just the Mississippi troops that are looking to carry this advance. So these guys look to General Boxer, and they're like, you know, can we halt? Let's, let's halt, let's form up, and let's see, you know, what shakes out from this point on. But General Barksdale, um, as we know, a very uh, energized individual today, he said, no, crowd them. We have them on the run. Brave Mississippians, one more charge, and the day is ours. And so on this movement, the Mississippi Brigade continued while still incurring casualties. And roughly as the 13th, 17th, and 18th Mississippi advanced through these fields beyond us, which we will do in just one moment here, he will fall wounded. Some will say shot up to upwards of, of five different times. Um, and in fact, General Graham, as he is trying to reform his line, he will also become a casualty in this battle. One soldier wrote that, quote, In his impetuous bravery, he goes too far. The enemy's bayonets bristle about him, yet he strikes right and left. And in the lull, the writer distinctly hears him say, I won't surrender. I'm a brigadier general, I won't surrender. And he has unceremoniously pulled off his horse, and we are without a general. So with that, let us commence to follow the 13th, 17th, and 18th as they will press toward what is known as the Plum Run Swale. We're going to be walking through these fields. If I could ask folks to try and do this in a roughly um, single file or two-person line. We don't want to tramp through the farmer's fields to cause too much more damage. And we are going to press. There's actually a break in the fence to um, more toward the, the right here. I want you guys to go through that break. And I'm going to go up and over and meet at the horse trail. Barksdale's men will, the 13th, 17th, and 18th, will advance through the fields behind us, um, sort of in the same path from which we came, and they will look to exploit the Union lack of reinforcements. Now, as the Union Army, uh, Meade realized the precarious nature of Sickles' line. He knew that Sickles being out there did not have enough men to defend it. He would have to send in troops to cover what Sickles should have been holding in the first place. And I think now you can even see Cemetery Ridge much more defined. We've got the Pennsylvania Monument over to our left, and we have Cemetery Ridge where you can see some of the traffic on to our far east. It is this gap right here that Sickles' men should have been in, and then, of course, continuing south to Little Round Top. But there was nothing here. The Union Army had to plug the gap. 
and they would call upon troops from Willard's brigade. Now, Colonel George Willard had some issues in the past. His men were not thought to be of good fighting prowess, and unfortunately they gained the um, moniker of being cowards as a result of action that happened in Harper's Ferry. Now, there was... Um, Stonewall Jackson arrived in Harper's Ferry a few days before Antietam, and the troops would engage. Now, Willard's men had been new, green, had not really been tested in battle, and unfortunately, during the uh, portion of the combat, you've got part of the brigade, part of Willard's brigade, running during the course of the combat. And then one of the soldiers said, quote, They were running in every direction. I saw them in the bushes and behind trees and rocks. In wild confusion and dismay, unfortunately, the men were really never allowed to testify as to what happened, and the entire brigade, really, you know, just one regiment was actually dealing with the running and the leaving of the scene, but the entire brigade would soon be known as cowards and not known for their fighting prowess. So now here on July 2nd, 1863, they will be forced into the front once more, and can they hold this position? Can they live up to, um, or maybe remove that unfortunate name? That they, had, that they had gained. Uh, many of the men refused to participate in military drill after that event. And in fact, another soldier, um, when writing of the event at Harper's Ferry, said, quote, a band of young volunteers, patriotic, high-minded, rushing at the call of the president to the defense of principles, which they esteemed vital, and a flag which they deemed sacred, were, at the very outset of their career, made victims instead of heroes. Here, July 1863, Willard's brigade and his men may have a chance to redeem themselves. Now, some stories go that supposedly Hancock uh, rode in front of their brigade to lead them down to this portion of the field. This is not where they started. In fact, Willard's brigade would form up and be ready to go up by the old Cyclorama building, up on Cemetery Ridge, if you're familiar with the battlefield, actually closest to the Bryan farm. They would be formed there, and then they would be um, brought down upon Cemetery Ridge. They prepared for battle. They basically had three regiments in front of the line, one regiment in back. The uh, 39th New York would, is the one regiment that would be in the back and would end up veering off to the left during the course of the action. They would form up in the swale directly, or I'm sorry, in the swale. On Cemetery Ridge, directly behind us, and they would advance with bayonets fixed. It was thought that they would have a difficult time firing when they had their bayonets fixed. However, the idea was that they weren't going to be doing a lot of firing. This was going to be a one-shot deal, basically. They were going to remove these incoming troops as quickly as they could, again, in an attempt to redeem themselves. Willard had the bayonets fixed and ordered the men forward. Quote, at the command, the regiment with the brigade... Not a man in the whole line faltering or hesitating for an instant hurled themselves upon the advancing foe. A low cry, remember Harper's Ferry, was heard in our ranks and swelled into a shout from hundreds of voices. Remember Harper's Ferry rose above the roar of the musketry and into this hell of destruction we were ordered to charge. Willard's men would come across the, the plains that you see here. They would attack Barksdale's men as Barksdale's men are pushing into what we refer to as the Plum Run Swale. And there would be some fierce fighting, um, and Willard's men would actually come through the swale. And long story short, Barksdale's men would not be able to hold against this attack. Keep in mind, the 21st has ended up over beyond the Trostle Farm. They have dealt with the 9th Massachusetts. They attempted to press forward, but they will soon be turned back because the 39th New York will come across the fields almost at an angle and engage them. Colonel Humphrey soon realizing that he is the only person out there, he will pull his men back. But now, Mississippi, 13th, 17th, and 18th, as they, as they are pressing down into the Plum Run Swale, they are also realizing that they have no more reinforcements behind them. Wilcox, to their left, has swung further to the left than initially anticipated, and General Walford, who was in their rear, has not followed them through these fields, but he has actually stayed more closer to the Wheatfield Road. By this point, this brigade, that brigade of 1,600 men is dwindling greatly. It is also within these fields, as they press their attack toward Willard's men, that General Barksdale will fall mortally wounded. Um, some soldiers write about him having four or five uh, bullet holes in his body. The 
Smith will recapture the gun from Colonel Humphreys. It said that it was, at, it was at this time that he would then order his men to withdraw. Willard's men will probably advance roughly 400 yards beyond the swale, pushing the Mississippians back to the Emmitsburg Road. Um, Colonel E.P. Alexander, who had moved those batteries forward, is going to have some of those guns along the Emmitsburg Road directing their fire here. We're looking at about 7 o'clock in the evening, roughly. As Barksdale's men, this attack will start to peer out, and they will have to return back from whence they came. Now, it is at this point that Barksdale is wounded, Willard is, is wounded, both soon to be dead on the field, and the press of the Confederates on July 2nd, 1863, is going to come to a close on this end of the field. What we're going to do now is we are con going to conclude with Willard's group. What he is doing right now is doing his own conclusion, and we're going to um, wait a few minutes for Matt to go ahead and finish up. We're going to then bring everybody together and do one final conclusion for the whole entire group. The Atkinsons have reunited on PCN. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. For the crowd, thank you. What we're going to do now is conclude the programs officially. And, you know, Matt and I, as we worked on these, we, uh, you know, we really enjoyed it. And we really enjoyed the opportunity to tell you these stories. Willard will punch through, Barksdale will retreat. And to sum it up very succinctly, you know, we said by roughly 7 o'clock the battle is still undecided. The ulti ultimate irony in this whole day is that Lee cannot accomplish his objective. And no one really gains or loses, in a sense, anything substantial. Of course, we, we talk about lives, and that is always a substantial loss. But the reality is that Sickles men move out to that peach orchard, they are pushed back and will end up, ironically, where they should have been in the first place. The Confederates will advance and press the Union line, but they will not punch through um, and take Cemetery Ridge. They will retreat back to the Emmitsburg Road, just a few hundred yards from which they started, as the Union Army will retreat back to Cemetery Ridge, where they should have been in the first place. But as the sun was setting, redemption would be found. With the repulse of the Confederates, the Union line had been protected and secured. On July 2nd, Willard's men, with the looming stigma of Harper's Ferry, would run no more. They would do what they came here to do, and they would press Barksdale's men back toward the Confederate line. And on behalf of Matt and myself, we would honestly, from the bottom of our hearts, like to thank everyone for coming out to our programs. Someone had mentioned earlier that it's kind of hard when you have these dual programs that, that meet, you know, which one to pick, which one to go on. And we are very blessed that all of you took time out of your days to listen to what we had to say, to hear the stories of the men, especially that fought here, and walk in these fields, which they walked in July 2nd, 1863. So with that, we want to say thank you so much for coming out, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day here at Gettysburg.